Our Bible reading tonight comes from Joshua chapter 11. When Jabin, king of Hazor, heard this, he sent word to Jobab, king of Medon, to the kings of Shimron and Aksaf, to the northern kings who were in the mountains, in the Arab of south of Kinnereth, in the western foothills, and in Nebath Dor on the west, to the Canaanites in the east and west, to the Amorites, Hittites, Pezirites, and the Jebusites in the hill country, and to the Hivites below Hermon in the region of Mizpah. They came out with all their troops and a large number of horses and chariots, a huge army as numerous as the sand on the seashore. All these kings joined forces and made camp together at the waters of Meron to fight against Israel. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them because by this time tomorrow, I will hand them all over to Israel slain. You are to hamstring their horses and burn their chariots. So Joshua and his whole army came against them suddenly at the waters of Merom and attacked them. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Israel. They defeated them and pursued them all the way to greater Sidon, to the Misperoth Mam and to the valley of Mizpah on the east until no survivors were left. Joshua did to them as the Lord had directed. He ham hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots. At that time, Joshua turned back and captured Hazar and put its king to the sword. Hazar had been the head of all these kingdoms. Everyone in it they put to the sword. They totally destroyed them, not sparing anything that breathed, and he burned up Hazar itself. Joshua took all these royal cities and their kings and put them to the sword. He totally destroyed them as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. Yet Israel did not burn any of the cities built on their mounds except Hazor, which Joshua burned. The Israelites carried off for themselves all the plunder and livestock of these cities, but all the people they put to the sword until they completely destroyed them, not sparing anyone that breathed. As the Lord commanded his servant Moses, so Moses commanded Joshua, and Joshua did it. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. So Joshua took this entire land, the hill country, all of the Negev, the whole region of Goshen, the western foothills, the Arabah, and the mountains of Israel with their foothills, from Mount Halak, which rises from Seir, to Balgad in the valley of Lebanon beyond Mount Hermon. He captured all their kings and struck them down, putting them to death. Joshua raged war against all these kings for a long time, except for the Hivites living in Gibeon. Not one city made a treaty of peace with the Israelites, who took them all in battle. For it was the Lord himself who hardened their hearts to rage war against Israel, so that he might destroy them totally, exterminating them without mercy as the Lord had commanded Moses. At that time, Joshua went and destroyed the Ancanites from the hill country from Hebron, Hebdeba and Anab, from the hill country of Judah, from all the hill country of Israel, Joshua totally destroyed them and their towns. No Ancanites were left in Israel territory, only in Gaza. Gath and Ashod did survive. So Joshua took the entire land just as the Lord had directed Moses and he gave it in an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal divisions. Then the land had rest from war. Someone's adjusted this. You ever did? Thank you. Uh, and this morning was so low down that it felt like I was in the long arm syndrome. Uh, thank you, Beck. That's, I think what happens when people get these Old Testament readings with all kinds of names, they probably think, oh, why is it my turn to do the reading? Um, because some of those names are difficult to pronounce, and uh, I still struggle with some of them. So well done to Beck for having to do all those names. 
Why don't you join with me as we pray and ask that the Lord might help us this evening. We need help from him if you're going to understand his word. Our Father, we come before you this evening in humility, for you are a great God, and you have done great things, and our very breath is dependent upon your grace. And so when we consider how great you are, we feel very insignificant, and we are insignificant compared to you, and yet you have set your love upon us. You have sent your only Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come and pay a ransom for your people, to die in their place. And you thus have placed such value on those you have called. And we thank you that we can come to you based on what Jesus has done. And we can approach you with confidence. And we can spend time worshiping you. And even though we haven't been able to sing tonight, our hearts have been singing. Our minds have been singing silently. And we thank you that we can worship you like this because of what Christ has done for us. We recognize that our worship continues as we seek to understand your word. And so we pray that you would open it up to us, that you would help it to become clear, and that you would help us to see its relevance to our lives this evening. And we pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Many, many years ago now, in fact, I, I was just talking to someone recently, this is my 13th year here at Castle Hill Baptist. Someone asked me, how long have you been here this morning? I said, well, this is year 13. Now, some of you may think it's 13 years too long, but nevertheless, we were in Queensland initially, and I remember going to a Baptist Union meeting where it was all the Baptist churches gathered together. And as they've tried to do with those meetings, they've tried to move away from it just being a, an administrative kind of, you go through an agenda meeting, and they have a whole lot of electives that you do. And one of the electives I thought that interested me, that I thought I would go to and see uh, what it was, was international speaker, was talking about church life and, and things that you can do to help your church grow. And I thought, well, there must be some interesting uh, ideas that might come there that we haven't thought about that we might be able to implement. And as a pastor, you're always looking for ways in which you can help God's kingdom grow. I mean, it is just something that is close to one's heart. And so I went to this uh, conference. It was, an, as I say, international speaker who had written a whole book. And he sat us down and he began to explain to us what they'd done when they set up their church. And what they'd done was this, is they'd uh, found a place where they wanted to worship, and then they had sent out a survey to the suburbs, and they had surveyed, I don't know how many thousands of people, I don't know how many surveys they got back from that. And then what they'd done is they got a whole lot of different community leaders, so they'd got Muslims, Hindus, uh, they'd got uh, Jehovah Witnesses, they'd got some business people, um, and they had got them together in a, in a big group, and they did this kind of uh, questions with them in the group to find out what kind of things they wanted from a church. And so once they'd compiled all of that data from the people out there and these, these people within the community who were considered to be leaders, they analyzed the data and then based upon what people wanted, they set their church up on that particular basis. And I remember coming away from that meeting thinking to myself, does God's word have any relevance in this? Are we to allow the community to dictate to us what church should look like? Or should we be saying to ourselves, what does God say the church is and isn't? And what are the principles that we discover in God's word that teach us about what church life looks like? And how then are we consistently applying those principles? There was nothing of scripture. It was all about what the community wanted. And so it became a very seeker sensitive kind of a setup that uh, gathered around what they, they felt the felt needs were. And I kept coming back to myself wondering, well, what does God's word say regarding our greatest need? What is it that people need out in the community? And what is it that the church has to offer the community that is different 
to everyone else. And surely when you think about that and you begin to analyze it scripturally, the greatest need out there is for people to be saved. And the greatest need of the church is to go out there and witness the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And our greatest need is to ensure that as we begin to gather together, that what defines us is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he remains center, and the gospel remains center, and the church I- ensures that the way in which we operate is always consistent with what God has revealed in his word. Surely that is what church should consist of. Surely the word of God is our guide, and where we gain our wisdom from, and where our springboard is into the community. And the Word of God teaches us and instructs us and gives us insight in how we are to do that. It's so easy to rely on secular means to do things. It's so easy to try and find out what felt needs are of people and then base your church on the felt needs rather than what the real needs are that Scripture defines. And Joshua, in this situation is demonstrating to us the difference between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. The difference between fighting God's way or fighting the world's way. And Joshua exemplifies leadership in that. He doesn't succumb to the outward pressures that might be exerted upon him. That might seem from a secular perspective the right way of doing things, but he ensures that the way in which they win this battle is to rely upon God and to be faithful to what God has commanded them. This is not about gathering the best weaponry. This is not about having a fleet of chariots that will give them an advantage and an army that carries the weaponry of the secular nations. Because at that stage, from about 1500 onwards, chariots became the way in which warfare is being fought. Joshua instead instead, relies on the strength of God and implements the promises of God and trusts in the promises of God. And thus, when he goes out into war, he goes out based upon the fact that God has assured victory if Israel are faithful to his promises. And Joshua provides for us a model of fighting God's way and implementing God's promises and relying upon God's word and trusting in God's strength and allowing God to achieve the victory. Because at the end of the day, who gets glorified? Joshua or God? Who wins the victory? Joshua or God. And this account is very clear that the hero of the story is not Joshua, is not the people, but is God. God remains at the center. And Joshua and the people simply faithfully obey what God has commanded them to do. And so I want you to see as Joshua does that, some of the things that Joshua does in order to ensure that He is faithful to God. Firstly, I want you to notice the nature of God's call, verses 1 to 5. Now, some of these verses I'm going to read, some for the sake of time I will. The nature of God's call. When Jabin, king of Hazor, heard of this, he sent word to Jobab, king of Madon, to the kings of Shimron and Aksva, and to the northern kings who were in the mountains in the Arabah, south of Kinnereth, in the western foothills, and in Naboth door on the west to the Canaanites in the east and west to the Amorites, the Hittites, and all the other arts in the hill country. Below Hermon in the region of Mitzpah, they came out with all their troops, a large number of horses and chariots. Now that's significant. When he gives you that information, the narrator is putting that information in there because he wants you to understand what Joshua is facing. A large number of horses and chariots, a huge army, as numerous as the sand on the seashore. All these kings joined forces and made camp together at the waters of Merim to fight against Israel. Now the author is trying to help us to see that the opposition Joshua encounters is overwhelming. 
Not only is he at a numerical disadvantage, and he is, because now you're not just dealing with one nation, but you're dealing with a whole range of nations who have come together, and so you are outnumbered in the battle. When I did national service, we were always taught that if you're going into a conventional warfare situation, you should always go in with the odds of being three to one, so that you have three to their one. Those are the odds you want to work with. Joshua is going in with an odds of probably 10 to 1 against him. He is vastly outnumbered. But not only is he outnumbered numerically, he's outnumbered technologically. Now, if I can try and put this into contemporary terms, imagine going into a battle today with a cavalry, a force of uh, people on, on horses with cavalry against tanks and against airplanes. It would be ludicrous. You would look at that and say, there's just no chance. You're going to get absolutely annihilated. That's the situation that Joshua is facing. He's facing a, an advanced army that is technologically way ahead of where Israel are. He doesn't have the weaponry. And the reason he doesn't have the weaponry is because God has already said to the Israelites, I don't want you to accumulate horses or chariots. Listen to uh, the psalmist in Psalm 20. Some trust, verse 7, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of Yahweh our God. When you, Deuteronomy 21, when you go to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and even a greater army than yours, do not be afraid of them, because Yahweh your God who brought you up out of Egypt will be with you. And so Joshua is encouraged to know that in spite of the depths of opposition against him, it is God who will enable him to win the victory. And what you and I need to understand from this in ministry, in seeking to follow God, is that opposition is inevitable. And sometimes opposition is overwhelming. And sometimes opposition isn't only from without, but sometimes it comes from within. Sometimes the most difficult form of opposition are those who oppose you within the church. And sometimes you will be pressured from without to conform to the particular norms of the world. You encounter that as you go out into the world because the world is diametrically opposed to the Lord Jesus Christ and the values by which you live and the principles on which your life is staked and the way in which you work out your faith is going to be often very different to the way the world lives so that our values are based on God's values. Our ethics are based on the word of God. We don't do the things that the world does. We don't operate like them. We don't talk like them. We don't think like them. We don't go to the same places as them. Sometimes we dress differently because we dress in a way that's going to be pleasing to God. Our music may be different to their music. We don't watch the same things that they watch. Our lives are fundamentally different because they are driven by wanting to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. And that inevitably is going to cause opposition. And when you share the gospel, and when you speak to people about your faith, you should not be surprised when they oppose you. Jesus said you will face opposition in this world. Jesus faced opposition. Jesus struggled with those who tried to trip him up in his ministry and eventually ended up on the cross because of the opposition. And sometimes it feels as though you're way in the minority. And sometimes being in the minority means that you are going to have laws that are passed that are opposed to what you know is right in the sight of God. And then the issue really becomes whether or not you will stand firmly upon God's word and persevere in God's word and not crumple because of the opposition. And that's much easier said than done, is it not? Because when everyone else is on the same wavelength, and you are operating on a completely different wavelength, then to stand up and be picked out of the crowd and be alone is far more difficult than simply to join in with the crowd and say, yes, I'll follow their logic and follow their ethics. Joshua needed to show tenacity and perseverance. You'll notice that the author says that the conquest isn't a quick one. 
In fact, it comes out in the last few verses that this is a long conquest. Look at verse 18. I can read just that one verse to you. Verse 18. When I find it, Joshua waged war against all these kings for a long time. Now it's estimated, there's no absolute definite about the number, that it's probably about a seven year time period we're looking at here. And the reason that it's probably a seven year time period is because of the age of Caleb. Caleb, when he uh, goes into the promised land as a spy with Joshua, we are told. Uh, later on in, in chapter 14, that he was, 30, he was 40. When he comes into the promised land, when they cross over the Jordan, we're told that's 38 interval, so he's 78. When he gets his allotment of the land, we are told that now uh, he is 85. So there are probably round about a seven-year period where Joshua is going to war. So Joshua is having to persevere with great tenacity and great reliance upon the Lord in order for him to achieve that victory. It's not just a quick victory that happens overnight. And it is through relying upon the Lord, as we will see, and it is through being empowered by God that he finally achieves victory and gets control of the entire land, even though there are some cities that remain unconquered and that are going to create problems in the future. Joshua simply gives a highlight of the conquest and gives us a summary version of how these kings are ultimately defeated. And what is true of Joshua is true of you, is it not? That the Christian life is a long life of endurance, a long life of perseverance. It's not just a short battle that you and I are engaged on. And while we are not engaged in a physical battle, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 6 says we are engaged in a spiritual battle. Our battle is not against what we see, our battle is in the invisible realm against the forces that we do not see that are exercised against us. And so the Apostle Paul encourages us to take on the armor of God. And we are much engaged in warfare, it's just a different kind of warfare as Joshua was when he invaded the land of Canaan. And that means as a believer, if God blesses you with long life, and I pray that he does for all of you sitting here, that it's going to be a long path of perseverance. And along that path, you are going to come against lots of obstacles, lots of potholes, lots of hurdles to overcome. And if you don't believe me, those of you who are younger, go and speak to some more mature Christians. Let them tell you about some of the obstacles that they've encountered. Let them tell you about some of the opposition that they've had to endure. It is what it is. And so, like Joshua, there needs to be a a sense of tenacity in persevering in spite of the odds and the obstacles that you and I face. I remember some, uh, when I was, again, much, much younger, a teenager, and we were at a friend's house, and we had this little, there were four of us, competition of who could swim the most underwater, how many lengths you could do underwater in the pool. And so the first person dived in and did four lengths underwater. And so that became the standard. We had to do four lengths. And the next person went in and managed four lengths um, I went in, I won't tell you, I don't want to sound like I'm boasting, and did my lengths. And then the last person got in, and they got to three and a half, and they stuck their head up. And when I turned to this friend of mine who knew the boy well, he said to me, I knew that was going to happen. He doesn't have the willpower to persevere when the going gets tough. Do you have the willpower to do that extra half length? To persevere when your lungs are screaming at you, Come up for air, come up for air. And your body is screaming and saying, you need air. Will you persevere when the opposition is at its thickest? Will you persevere when you are alone and standing alone and everyone else is against you? Will you endure mocking? Will you endure hardship? Will you keep saying, I am continuing on this path that God has laid out before me? How do you do that? Well, you do that, secondly, with the assurance of God's help. 
I won't read the verses for the sake of time. Verses 6 to 9 and verses 21 to 22. The assurance of God's house, God, help, God is on their side. And so Joshua knows that when he engages these chariots, the superior force, he's not going to win the battle through his own ingenuity. It's not through strategic planning. It's not through battle plans. It's not through saying, I've got this incredible uh, strategy whereby I'm going to defeat these uh, forces against me. Rather, it is by trusting in and relying upon the strength that God gives him. I spoke a little bit about that this morning, those of you who are here. And notice as well that is mentioned in here. It talks about right at the end of the chapter, it's almost an afterthought, that one of the peoples that they were, had to defeat were the Anakites. Do you remember the Anakites or what I had said about them earlier? Let me read it to you. Because earlier on in the piece, in Deuteronomy 128, where can we go? Our brothers have made us lose heart. They say, this is talking about the land, before they conquer it, the people are stronger and taller than we are. The cities are large and the walls are up to the sky. We even saw the Anakites there. Now, Let's read on, Deuteronomy uh, 9.2. The people are tall and strong, the Anakites. You know about them. You've heard it said, who can stand up against the Anakites? And now these are the very people that the text says Joshua defeats. So in spite of the opposition, in spite of the fact that these people are particularly tall and particularly seen as strong and powerful, God equips Israel to win the battle. The important lesson, therefore, that Joshua and the people need to remember is that the battle is not won on their own strength, but the battle is won by the Lord. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Paul, writing to the Philippians, having experienced what it's like to have a lot, having experienced what it's like to have nothing, in chapter 3, 4, verse 19 says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, detailing his sufferings, saying, I've been shipwrecked, I've gone without food, I've gone without clothes, is able to say in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9b, uh, he's able to say, your grace is sufficient for me. Your power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will all the more gladly boast about my weakness, for when I'm weak, then you are strong. And the point of all of this is that as believers, if we are going to be effective in this world, it is going to be through the strength that God supplies, and that comes through the power of the Holy Spirit, who equips and enables us to live in a way that is pleasing to God. But that doesn't mean that you and I just sit back and do nothing. You see, I think that's the danger. Paul, when he speaks about how he has strived, he says, I have worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God in me. In other words, there is Paul striving with all the energy that Paul has, recognizing that for all of his striving and all of the energy he has, it ultimately comes from God. And so there is that dual sense where Paul doesn't sit back and wait for things to happen, but Paul gets on and he he does what needs to be done, and he strains, and he uses himself to the best of his ability, recognizing that all of that is made possible through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is true for him, what is true for Joshua, what is true for God's people back then, is equally true for you and I now. We persevere, and we keep in the battle because God empowers us. And as I said this morning, I feel like I'm repeating myself to those of you who were here this morning. There just happened to be similar themes. Is that power we have from God is supernatural. It is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. It is the same power that God uses to create the world. 
And that power is the power through the Holy Spirit that is given to every believer because God's Spirit dwells in you and enables us to do that which we cannot do on our own strength. And so you are able to overcome. You are able to live in a way that is pleasing to God. You are able to minister in ways that were, would not be possible were it not for God. God is able to equip you when you feel as though your strength is depleted and when you're down in the dumps and it feels as though you've got nothing left to give. God is able to empower you to keep on going. I know I've dealt with Christians at times where they are... Uh, 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 inundated with trials, it feels very heavy, it feels as though their strength is gone, and at times they've wanted to give up. But God is able to help you in those circumstances to keep on keeping on. And it comes, it, it means for us to rely upon Him, to look to Him, and to trust Him for that power. God literally has His arm around you. And when you cannot walk, and when you are down and out for the count, God picks you up, and God enables you, because He carries you when you can't pick yourself up. There's a wonderful illustration of this. I may have told you this before. If I have, just smile politely. It's a good story. So bring this home with force. It was Monday night, August the 3rd, 1992. Some of you might have watched this at the Olympics in Barcelona, Spain. At the track and field stadium, the gun sounded for the 400 meters semi final. About 100 meters into the race, Britain's Derek Redman crumpled to the track with a torn right hamstring. Medical attendants rushed out to assist him, but as they approached Redmond, he waved them aside, struggled to his feet, and crawled and hoped in a desperate effort to finish the race. Four years earlier, he had also qualified for the 1988 Olympics in Seoul, Korea. 90 seconds before his, his heat, he had to pull out of the Olympics because of an Achilles tear, a tendon problem. Following that injury, he had five surgeries. Yet somehow, he had qualified again for the 1992 Olympics and had just suffered a career-ending injury. But he said to himself, I'm not quitting. I'm going to finish this race. He began working his way around, hopping, crawling at times down the lane. Up in the stands, a big guy wearing a t-shirt, tennis shoes, and a nightcap that said, just do it, hopped across uh, the, the front, barreled out of the stands, hurled aside the security guard, ran to Derek Redmond's side, and embraced him. It was Jim Redman's father, uh, Jim Redman, Derek's father. Jim was one of those sports dad who changes his whole life for the sake of his athletic child. He, cha he changed jobs. He moved to find the best training for his son. Now, arm around his son's waist, Derek, arm around his dad's thick shoulders and neck, they continued down the track. Mom and sister were watching in the stands, uh, sorry, back the race back home on television. His sister, who was pregnant, went into false labor. His mother was weeping. There at the stadium, the crowd, standing, cheering. Derek and his dad worked their way around the track until finally, arm in arm, they cross the finish line. If that's how an earthly father responds to a son, how much more when you are stumbling and down for the count does God come to you in your desperateness and put his arm around you and grab you and say, my child, you're not in this alone. I will carry you. I will strengthen you. I will power you. It may seem overwhelming to you. You may feel crushed, but I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm on your side. Paul writes to the Romans in chapter 8, verse 31, and he says, If God be for us, who can be against us? God is on your side. 
Thirdly, I want you to notice the model of God's servant. Verses 12 and verse 15 and verse 23. Notice how often the text mentions that Joshua did as God commanded. Verse 12. The model of God's servant. Joshua took all these royal cities and their kings and put them to the sword. He totally destroyed them as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. Look at verse 15. As the Lord commanded his servant Moses, so Moses commanded Joshua, and Joshua did it. He left nothing undone, all that the Lord commanded Moses. Look at verse Again, verse 23. So Joshua took the entire land just as Yahweh had directed Moses, and he gave it as an inheritance to the Israelites according to their tribal divisions. Now, the author is trying to make a point here that Joshua obeys God, and he obeys immediately. There's no argument, there's no debating. There's no saying to the Lord, hang on, maybe we should go down to Assyria and see if we can buy some chariots of the Assyrians because we're outnumbered and they've got a much greater force than us. Let me just get better equipped and our soldiers better ready for the battle and then we'll engage. No, Joshua immediately obeys God. He immediately submits. He immediately recognizes that the only way to live and to be successful is to live in obedience to God. And what is true of Joshua is true of us. We need to obey God unhesitatingly. So often, it's easy for us to begin to get into debates with God around certain things that perhaps go against our grain. Lord, are you sure you've really said, is that not the first deception? When Satan comes to Adam and Eve and grabs Eve and says to, did God really say Did God really say that it's wrong to lie? It's just a small lie. It's not going to do any harm. No one's going to get hurt. Did God really say that I can't bend the rules a little bit sexually when I'm dating? Do I really have to stay pure? Did God really say I shouldn't lose my temper when someone has provoked me and they deserve it? Did God really say that I should be more careful with my words or a little harsh word here and there is not going to do too much damage? And so we can begin to question God and we can begin to ask Him whether or not it really applies to us. Did God really say that I should give some of my money to the church? After all, it's my money and I worked hard for it. Did God really say that I shouldn't become so obsessed with materialism? Did God really say that iPhone 12 is not the one I should be buying? Because my iPhone 11 needs an upgrade. It's so easy for us to begin to question God's commands and begin to doubt what God has said and you know the funny thing is it's not funny but the reality is that every command God has given us is for our good every instruction that comes in his word is for our fulfillment of life in this world and when we submit and when we obey and when we live in accordance to what God has revealed then we discover the joy of our relationship with God then we come to experience the true nature of what it means to be a child of God then we begin to experience the contentment in this life that God has promised Then we begin to experience the smile of God upon us. Jesus said, if you love me, John 14, 15, you will obey my commands. And in John 15, 10, he says that if we obey his commands, we remain in his love. And in 1 John, he says his commands are not burdensome, they're not hard, they're not difficult. They're not meant to suppress us. They're not meant to make life unpleasant for us. They're not meant to rob us of some of the things that the secular world engage in that are less than right. 
But God gives us these commands so that we might, in fact, enjoy and experience life the way that God has created us to experience life. They are for your ultimate good. Obedience is to your benefit. And when we obey God, and when we live in submission to those commands, then we find spiritual fulfillment in our lives. You know, there's nothing worse than seeing a frustrated Christian, a Christian who has lost the joy of their salvation, a Christian who is struggling in their spiritual walk with God, and a Christian who has lost the the sense of God's presence in their life. And a Christian who is simply going through the motions and doing everything out of a sense of duty. It's God's love that ought to motivate us. It's wanting to please God that ought to motivate us. Our heart should be so in tune with His heart that we love to obey Him. And so the psalmist in Psalm 119 writes about God's precepts and how He loves them and how He loves to obey commands and how He finds life in obeying God's commands and how He finds great pleasure in being uh, uh, in submission to God's commands. And how He takes God's Word and He buries it deep within His heart so that it is from the heart, the wellspring of God's Word comes up out of His heart and is expressed into how He lives. And God's Word becomes the means by which His life operates. And it's not worldly wisdom, it's not secularism that drives Him. It's not doubting what God has said, but it's accepting that God knows what's good and God knows what's right. And God has created us to be in fellowship with Him. And God has created us to enjoy Him. And God has given us these instructions in His Word so that you and I might walk in a way that is not only pleasing to God, but fulfilling to us from day to day. Perhaps if you are a frustrated Christian, it's because this area of your life and obedience to God is not being lived the way it ought to be. And perhaps you need to take some time out in your day and you need to do some inner reflection and some self-reflection and you need to say to the Lord, where are those areas in my life that are no longer in submission to you? Where am I living in disobedience to you? Where am I questioning your goodness? Where am I questioning your wisdom? Where are you and I arguing? What are we arguing about? And maybe you need to bring your life once again under the submission of God in Christ because there is such joy and such fulfillment in that. It's so important that you and I learn that our obedience to Christ, though not perfect, must arise, should arise, out of our love for Jesus. Obedience must not become something slavish, but must be because we have come to understand how much God loves us. And so the motivations to obedience are ground in God's love. And when you fail in obedience, because you will fail, and I fail in obedience, remember that your salvation is not dependent upon your perfect adherence to obeying God's commands because it is dependent upon Jesus' perfect obedience. So when you do fail Him, it's not that your salvation is now lost. It's not as as though somehow your salvation is brought under question. It's not that somehow God loves you any less than what He loved you before because God in Christ has done what you and I cannot do. And yet, in spite of the reality that we grapple with sin and that we cannot ultimately live a life that is perfectly obedient to God and that we are going to fail, we have recourse, do we not? Because when we do fail and when we don't obey God and when we shake our fist in His face in whatever area it might be, whether that's done in an overt sense or a more subtle sense, we can fly to the cross because there there is forgiveness when we confess our sin. There, there is cleansing. There we are washed again. And I don't know about you, but I need to be washed every day. There is the cleansing blood of the Lord Jesus Christ 
who says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There is Isaiah who says, uh, Jeremiah rather, where God says, I will remember your sins no more. And Isaiah says, though they be as scarlet, they may be as white as snow. God offers forgiveness where we fail. And so we can run to him and find our souls ministered to by the grace of God. Let me ask you, how is your obedience? What does it look like? Is there a consistency? How does it rate in God's sight? Are you and God arguing about something? Are you fighting with God? Are you unwilling to let that one thing go? And saying to the Lord, but I know better, I know better. Or are you willing to relinquish that and give it back over to God and say, you take control. And then finally, I want you to notice, and this is quite frightening, the peril of hardened hearts. Now, we've said a lot about this already, so I don't want to spend a lot of time here. The peril of hardened hearts, verses 19 to 20. Uh, Nathan, Pastor Nathan, said a bit about this in the previous sermon. But there is a hardening of the heart here. There is a refusal of these nations to repent. There's a stubbornly gathering together opposing God. There's an unwilling to do what the Gibeonites said, at least even though they were deceptive in how they went about it, they recognized their need to go and make some kind of provision lest they too get wiped out. But there has been an accumulation of disobedience to God, an accumulation of sin, and as a result of that, God's judgment falls. And there is no escape. And there is tremendous lesson in there, is there not? There's a point at which when we continue to harden ourselves against God's work in our lives, where we harden ourselves against the gospel, where we refuse God's grace, where we reject His mercy, where we turn away from Him again and again, that God eventually says, that's it, time is up. Listen to Romans chapter 1, verse 24, Therefore God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. Verse 26, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. Verse 28, furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. There is Paul writing to these Romans saying there's a point at which God says, I'm done. And he gives people over to their sinfulness. He takes his hands off and his grace no longer is extended towards them. And he puts them beyond redemption. I don't know when that happens. I know that scripture speaks about the reality of that happening. And so can I say to you, I don't know if you're saved or not, but if you are one of those who continues to reject God, there's coming a time when God's patience will dry up and God will give you over and put you beyond the bounds of redemption. So can I urge you, before that happens, turn now. Turn away from your rebellion. Don't spurn God's grace don't continue to shake your fist in his face. Don't continue to reject his patience, his mercy, his grace, his love. God calls to you, come to me. He wants you to come into relationship with him. He offers forgiveness to all who will come. He's willing to wipe the slate clean. He's willing to enter into a relationship with you. He's willing to forgive you of your rebellion against him. He's willing to create in you a new person. He's willing to give you eternal life. But if you like the Canaanites and all the other 
Ites in this passage who continue to reject him, sooner or later you're going to put yourself into the point where God will give you over to your depraved heart. And that depraved heart will become your new reality that puts you beyond redemption. Oh, God forbid that that happens to anyone here this evening. That God may reach down into your soul and may call you to himself that you might turn before it's too late. Amen. Our Father, we pray that for any here who do not know you, that you would work in their hearts, that you would reveal Christ to them, that you would help them to turn away from their rebellion against you, soften their hearts. Don't let their hearts become so hard that that heart becomes set in concrete, unable to be broken through into. Oh God, you are the God of salvation. You are the author of life. You are the giver of eternal life. And so I pray that as the only one who can save, there, there just be one person here this evening, just one, who is not in a relationship with you, that you would shower them with your love and grace and draw them to yourself that they may come to know you and love you. Don't let them get to the point where they come and get beyond redemption. Continue to draw them, I pray. And for those who do know you and do love you and are serving you, I pray, Lord, for those who are struggling in their Christian walk, who spiritually are not where they ought to be. You know who they are and they know who they are. They can't hide it from you. Won't you revive them? Won't you confront them with yourself again? Won't you help them to come to you and offer their lives once again in submission to you and by your power to live in obedience to you? For those who are living in obedience, and there are many who are here this evening, continue to give them the energy they need to persevere Continue to strengthen them day by day. Help them to draw on that strength and to know that you will enable them to do that which they cannot do on their own. And for those who are feeling a little bit weak at the moment and feeling pressed down with burdens and cares, may you come alongside them and remind them that your grace is sufficient for them. Your power is perf made perfect in weakness. And I pray that you would help us as your people your called out ones, to go into a world that is hostile to us and to fight with the weapons that you give us, the spiritual armor that you have given us, that we might go out into the battle prepared, that we might fight your way, that you might be the one who guides and leads us, that we might take your word to a lost and dying world, that we might base our lives upon your word, that your word might direct our every movement, our every action, our every word. And we pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen.